Uh, the title of my message is The Child is Not Dead. And I want to talk to you a little bit today, first of all, about the intentionality of Jesus. I believe that we as Christians, I, I, um, many of us pastors here at Hungry Gen, Hungry Gen as a whole, and we face some persecution of people who think that what we do is wrong, or we should do it a better way, or a different way, or we shouldn't do that, we shouldn't say that, we shouldn't... You know, people will always have opinions. And me personally, I kind of got tired of apologizing for the ministry of Jesus. So I, I started, you know, digging really deep into Scripture. And I think you and I as living Christians, we should concentrate and focus more on apologetics than apologies. I think it's time to learn how to... Uh, the, uh, apologetics is defined by the defending of Scripture and the defending of what Scripture says. And I think we as Christians, it's important for us... To be able to stand up and not apologize. I hear too many Christians today that says, oh, Jesus didn't mean it that way. Let me explain to you in today's culture what Jesus meant when he did that. Or when he said this. Or when he said that. But we have not been called to be Jesus defense lawyers. You know that God can defend himself. Jesus Christ said what he said and his word is true today as well. Culture does not dilute or because we are, you know, we have to understand that, you know, the way that the culture was. What are you talking about? His words are eternal. He is literally the word of God. And so as Christians, we should learn to defend and not to apologize and say, oh, you know, oh, what he did. And, but to stand up and say, he said what he said. He meant what he meant. And I think part of the reason why you are here today is because you love a church that speaks the unadulterated, undiluted truth of the Word of God in our generation. And sometimes that brings some consequences, but we will always and forever stand for the truth that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. His teachings doesn't change because our culture changes. What he did back then is the same today. So um, something that I've really looked into lately is the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. I mean, there is four accounts of the ministry of Jesus. And it's just incredible when you start. Re I, I, I always find ways to, to keep myself, you know, extremely excited about reading the word of God. And there are. Seasons in my life when reading the Word of God is more like a chore than a passion thing. There are seasons like that. And I don't want to stay in the state of reading the Word of God as a chore for too long. Because it drains you. The Bible says that the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. So we have to make sure that we include the Holy Spirit. And something that I realized lately when I read about the ministry of Jesus... And I'm going to go through here from the book of Mark 4 and 5. Share a few accounts of Jesus here. Jesus was incredibly intentional in everything he did. There used to be verses that I skipped when I read about Jesus. There used to be, you know, I used to read his miracles and his teachings and everything like different isolated events. And that's powerful and that stands in and of itself. But you begin to read in the context of, let me tell you for example what I mean. When Jesus in Mark 5 went to cast out legion, he was preaching at the seashore of Galilee. And then he went across the water in a boat. When he stepped his foot on the seashore, a demoniac came up to him. And said, what have we to do with you? And then he cast them into the pigs. Everyone knows that story. Do you know what he did immediately after that? He went back right away. He crossed the sea for one man to be delivered. And then he came right back again. And continued teaching on the other side. Like, it's all there in scripture. And I, I never thought about that before. I encourage you, if you are looking, it's feeling dry when you read the Bible, go back to the gospel and find a map 
that maps out the movement of Jesus during his earthly ministry. It will actually blow your mind. If I was a disciple of Jesus, I would be following him like, we're going back. We just spent eight hours walking here. You prayed for one. Okay, okay. We're, we're. And all those things, he just mentioned like in between the miracles. He just says, and he left there. And you don't think about that. He left there. But then you think, okay, he was up here. He left there and the next place he's down there. That's two days walking. And he did one miracle over here, one miracle down here, one miracle over here. He was an intentional God. God is the most intentional. You, let, you think the things that happen in your life as a child of God, that, that when God is working out his purpose in your life, that he's not intentional about it, that it just happens by chance. God is intentional when he comes. He left 99 to find the one. God is an intentional God. So I want to show you a little bit about this experience here from Mark 4. We're going to go into talking about Jairus. But before then, I just want to show you, highlight something to you. Mark chapter 4 verse 35. On the same day, he had been teaching. Listen to that. Just that word, on the same day. That changes stuff if you haven't thought about it before. He's been preaching on the beach. He's been teaching all day. He's exhausted. On the same day, when evening had come, he said, let us cross over to the other side. Now they went into the boat and a great windstorm arose. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Everyone knows that story. You know, wow, so powerful. He could sleep in the midst of the storm. But if you understand the context, it's like... He was drained. He had been, he was, you remember he was 100% God, but he was 100% man. He wasn't, he didn't have supernatural power to where he didn't feel exhaustion. He was a man who felt the things that we feel, yet without sin. He felt exhaustion. The Bible even says the first verse that I ever memorized, Jesus wept. He laughed. There was, he was an, a man who felt everything that we felt. So he went over in the boat. Across the Sea of the Galilee. Now, the Sea of the Galilee, it could have been called the Lake of the Galilee. Because this is basically the size of it. It's about eight miles across. And if you go from the furthest point in the north to the furthest point in the south, it's about 13 miles. This, it, you know, you see the other side. Now, picture this for a moment here. They get into a boat. There is a storm so severe that fishermen think they're going to die. If I am in a construction site, because I'm not a construction worker, I'll, feel, uh, I'll be scared of when things come falling. Whoa, I, I can die here. But uh, someone who does it for a living, they kind of know how to not die in that profession. A storm on this sea here was so great that fishers thought they were going to die. Okay, remember that. He crosses over. They wake him. He rebukes the wind and the storm. And immediately it silences down. He comes over, steps his foot on the other side. And this demoniac comes up. Now let me, let me give you some clarity. Legion cast into pigs is covered in three passages. Mark 5, Luke 8, and Matthew 8. Here, critics of scripture say that there is a, this is a contradiction. Because if you know the Gospels, Matthew says that there were two demoniacs. While Mark and Luke says there was one. Okay, how many know that? And we kind of like brush it over like, yeah. You know, it's not, word is, the word of God is not contradiction, but I can't explain it either. Okay, I'm going to give you a key today to explain it. If I say that there is a woman sitting down here today, am I correct? Yes. If I say that there's 50 women sitting down here today, am I also correct? If you learn linguistics, you will see that statements at a face value may seem contradictory... But when you actually begin to understand how language is built up, 
it's actually not contradictory it's cohesive so how can two demoniacs meet Jesus and one demoniac meet Jesus I think it's simple Matthew is a book that summarizes a lot of he, he's the only one that covers from the very beginning to the very end and so I think there were two demoniacs and then he doesn't mention any more about them and he moves on and Jesus came back Mark and Luke says there was one demoniac sitting down in his right senses waiting for Jesus at the boat asking can I come with you and Jesus says no 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 you go back to your city and preach share your testimony of what has happened meaning I believe there were two people but one of them wanted to follow and that's the one that Mark and Luke highlights especially okay so there's no contradiction in scripture doesn't contradict it's the word of God praise God so he comes in and then this legion comes and I want to explain something to you I'm still talking about the intentionality of Jesus Jesus is a complete savage of a man he knows what he's doing and if he went across the boat it takes two hours without obstacles to cross the sea. With that wind in the night, it might have taken the whole night. They came there in the morning. That's why he was trying to sleep for a little bit. Because he's like, I'm going to face a legion in the morning. Let me rest for a little bit. This storm, it's not unto death. Let's keep going. And when he arrives, he prays for, for legion here. Now, let me give you some context. Because many people say, and this it, it's my brother Ed that actually piqued my interest in this story. And I, I did some research and I found out, wow, it's actually true. You know, when, when, you cast, when Jesus cast the demons into the pigs, as a deliverance minister and as a pastor, is one of the things I struggle to explain. People say different things. They're like, oh yeah, you know, if legions, which is like 2,000 to 5,000 demons, were cast out of that person... And not moved into a pig's first as a process of the deliverance that it would kill the person. I've heard that story. I've heard other stories that yes, truly Jesus compromised at that point with the demons and so on and so forth. Let me tell you what I believe now after having dug into this. The region that he came to was called the Gadarenes. Let's show the first map. Let's show the first map of Jesus' movement. Okay. Sea of Galilee... He was up here around the area of Gennesaret. Do you see it by the number 20? He moved down. This is Gadara. Okay. This is the city, the area of the Gadarenes. And when he crossed the water, that's the water that he crossed to that region there. The area, if you read it, it's called Decapolis. Decapolis is a Greek word that means 10 cities. Because the Greek had actually occupied that area. It belonged to the Greek. While other areas of Israel as we know today belonged to the Roman Empire. But that area the Greeks had come there. So there were Greeks there. There was Greek culture. Greek language and so many other things. There was a Greek colony if, I, if you wish. The, the Decapolis. This, the ten cities. And how they know that is because, remember there was a herd of pigs. Jews don't herd pigs. It's an unclean animal to Jews. They don't herd pigs. In fact, the, the, the Old Testament is full. You're not even allowed to touch a pig. Talk less of eat one. It's an unclean animal according to the Old Testament. So Jews wouldn't be herding pigs. And so the man comes, receives deliverance. He casts the demons into the pigs. The pigs instantly run off the cliff and drown. All of them. You can read it. If it's a Greek culture there. And this is the first time that Jesus ever entered that region. I believe that Jesus came to that region. To cast demons out of one or two people. So that he would declare to the principalities and the Greek gods. The Greek idols of that region. That the kingdom of God is at hand because let me tell you something Zeus is the Greek God guess what they sacrifice in their worship of Zeus guess one time pigs 
by committing, by performing one deliverance, Jesus Christ stopped the idol worship in that region and told the gods, the demons, the principalities over that region, there is a new sheriff in town. If Jesus knew that, and the demons are like, please let us go into the pigs. He's like, I knew you would ask. That's why I came here. I haven't just come to deliver one man. But I'm going to use that deliverance to deliver a region. Jesus was on the way to wage spiritual warfare there. And guess what? The storm we talked about. You know what those principalities, those powers, you know what they are? Zeus is the God of thunder and lightning. He's the God of storms. I believe that the principalities, those demonic powers of that region were so scared that they tried to intimidate Jesus from coming into that region. But you don't see him saying, oh, you spirit of the, of the thunder, I cast you down, I cast you out. He went in and one deliverance broke the power of those demons over that region. That is spiritual warfare and that is the intentionality of Jesus as you're sitting down as a child of God never underestimate what God can do with one prayer in your family never underestimate what Jesus can do with you opening your mouth and sharing the gospel to one person in your workplace. God is the God that works with what is in your hands. Not what is not in your hands. God works with what we've got. I believe that this is a stark reminder to us. To never think the prayer you offer for your family. The, the word that you share with someone. That it has no impact. You don't know what Jesus Christ can do with one prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. We prayed for our family members here. Some people are like, I've been praying for long. I haven't seen it yet. How long should I keep praying? God answered in the parable of the persistent widow. The answer is one word, until. How long should I pray for my family member to come back? Until. Because you don't know what is happening behind the scenes, behind the veil of this physical world, your word and your prayers have power. You don't know what is happening. Jesus knew. That's why he was ready to go into a boat, head over, face a storm. He rebuked the storm and instantly it stopped. I believe that was a demonic storm. It was a demonic storm because if you look at it, it's really small. For a fisherman to think that you're going to die in the storm. It has to be something weird going on about that storm. They grew up on that sea. So Jesus is intentional. As a little sidetrack, he, go, he goes back immediately. We're going to talk more about him coming back. He meets with Jairus. But he comes back in Mark 5. Preaches on the beach. Casts a demon out. Heals people goes to his hometown they, they, they say don't come here and then he goes north to the region of Tyre and Sidon can you show number two on the on map number two okay so the red dot signifies when he went went over that's where he went let's do number three okay he goes back again across the sea up close to his hometown Number four. Okay, you see the yellow one? He walks up to Tyre and Sidon, which is a Syrophoenician territory. Straight after that, Mark chapter 7. And listen to this. It says in Mark 7, he goes into one house when he gets there. And he doesn't want to be known that he's there. But one single woman finds him in the house and says, Lord... My daughter is home demon possessed. And he says, no, it, this is not for you. He went, do you know how far that is? 
you see that that's 10 miles. This is over 50 miles. That's an at least eight hour walk. Okay, it's a day's walk to get up there. He walks there. Goes and hides in one house. And this one woman with a daughter who's demon possessed finds her, finds him. And says, please, even the, even the master's crumbs falls to the dogs. And he says, wow, I've not seen such faith, faith in my region. That's why he says that. Because he came from south. He walked up there a whole day. Past the mountains and all that kind of stuff. Into the region of Syrophoenicia. And he says, go, your daughter is healed. You know what he does after that? Leaves. He went there. A one day walk. Goes into a house. It says he didn't want to be noticed. One woman only finds him. He says, I've not seen such faith before. Go, your daughter is healed. And then he heads back again. Another day's walk. His disciples following him, they're like, either this guy is the Messiah or his mentor. I don't know, but miracles are happening, so he's probably the Messiah. Because this is, seems to the ordinary eye very erratic. Okay? So let's, let's fi let, let them finish this announcement. And then we're going to continue. Let's do the last one. So listen. When he left the region of Decapolis, okay, the demon-possessed man, the legion who was healed and restored, that Jesus cast into the pigs, and they go, went and killed himself. He sat by the boat and said, please, can I come with you? This is a brand new convert. Brand new restored. Not a believer before. Brand new convert delivered. Sitting in his right, right mind. Please, can I follow? Most people, Jesus would tell them, come and follow me. And they're like, I have to go and bury my uncle. I, I'm not ready to come yet. This guy who's begging to come, he's like, no. Go back to your city and share your testimony. Okay. After that, it says that they came and they asked him to leave that region. You remember that? They said, please leave. We don't want trouble here. You have angered our idol gods. Please leave. He leaves and then all that happened. So after that, it says he goes to Tyre and Sidon, which is far up there. And then guess where he walks right back to? He walks right back to the place that banned him. The place he said, don't come here. We don't want to hear about you or your miracles. He walks right back there two chapters later. He's a, he's a savage. <laughs> and he's intentional. You think that testimony that he told that one brother to go and share to his city? You think it had no effect? You think he was just saying that for fun? Because when he came back from the region where they told him, get out of here. It says that they brought the sick to him the moment he came into the cities. He said, please, a man who was blind from birth and death. Can you please pray for him? Jesus prays for him and he receives healing. Crowds start following him so much that he has to perform a miracle to feed them. 4,000 people in that region, not including children and, and women. And he feeds them with seven loaves. That's Jesus. That testimony, it was a seed to prepare the ground for when I come back in two chapters. <laughs> That's Jesus. Your testimony, if you're keeping it to yourself, do you know who is not coming to Jesus because of that? Don't hold your testimony back. If not everyone in your workplace knows your testimony, it's time to change that. Because your testimony is a seed that will plant in the soil and cause faith to grow in people's lives. Do you think that testimony that that one brother shared in his city, do you think they would have brought the sick to Jesus if not for that testimony? Jesus knew what he was doing. And when you, I encourage you guys, read the Bible with a map. You know, at the back of you, look at this. Look at what is in the back of my Bible. I always used to read it like, oh yeah, that's cool. Look at Paul's three trips. And then when you start looking at it, it changes a lot. You realize that these stories are not just isolated events. Jesus knew what he was doing. He was on mission. He went to the east, declared the kingdom of God is here. Go and share your testimony. He went to the north. One woman, he delivers the daughter without even seeing her in her house. He goes back again. That is the intentional Jesus that we serve. When you hear a notion in your heart, 
when God is putting a person on your heart. Ah, someone else will pray for that person. Someone else will share their testimony to that person. You don't think God knows what he's doing when he's asking you to do it? You don't think that you have the exact words needed to change that person's life? I'm talking about intentional disciples of Jesus. Jesus was so incredibly intentional that we cannot afford to be unintentional in our walk. Everything he did was a puzzle piece. And the disciples following him, they're like, I can't see the full picture. We're just going to follow him. But when you obey, when he tells you something, I want to encourage you. If you feel the Holy Spirit, give to him. Hey, pray for that person. Tell that person. Share your testimony. He has a purpose for putting that on your heart. Do not neglect the voice of God in your heart. We have to start doing what he asks us to do. That's crazy. I don't know that person. I know it's crazy. And it's savage. And it's intentional. Just like me. That's God. I know it feels crazy right now. Getting into a boat or walking for a day. I've got a purpose. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I've got the full picture. Praise God. So. Let's get back to Mark chapter 5 here. After he finishes, he comes back. And this is where I really want to give you a personal encouragement today. When he came back, Jairus, which was the head of the church of Capernaum, the leader of the synagogue, I mean. He came and met Jesus at the seaside and said, my daughter is at the point of death. Would you come and please pray for her? Jesus follows Jairus, said, yeah, let's go. I'm going to pray for your daughter. She'll be fine. Let's go. And then the crowd is already there waiting. And the crowd starts slowing down the movement of Jesus. And I want you to picture Jairus here. First of all, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue there. Let, let me tell you this. Jesus isn't on the top 10 favorites of the leaders of the synagogues, the Pharisees and the leaders. It's kind of like, do I talk to him? Do I not talk to him? Like, these people seem to hate him. Like, do I, do I not? He came because of desperation. He said, Jesus, please come and pray for my daughter. It says the daughter was 12 years old. She was at the point of death. So the crowd comes and starts pushing on Jesus. Can, I, can, I, can, you, can you tell that Mark 5 is my favorite chapter in the Bible right now? There's so many great things from one chapter. Okay. And so he goes. And then the crowd comes. And the crowd starts slowing Jesus down. And Jerry's like, come, come, hurry up. Let's go, let's go, Jesus. My daughter, she needs your help urgently. And suddenly, in the midst of the crowd, they're barely moving because everyone is pushing on. Jesus stops. He says, stop. Who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you serious right now? We're just coming from the boat. This is probably one of those where like it doesn't make sense. Uh, everyone, Jesus, maybe. He's like, no, someone touched me. Now let me put this in perspective. There was a woman with the issue of blood who broke the rules. How long had she had the issue of blood? 12 years. How old was the daughter of Jairus? 12 years. A miracle... Someone who had had a sickness for 12 years. The sickness was about to come to an end. Someone else whose life of 12 years was about to come to an end. Imagine hearing and seeing that as Jairus. He's like, oh, someone got there before me. Someone distracted Jesus. He has stopped and now he's attending to this other case. It might seem serious, but mine is greater. That sickness, this is death. And, and Jairus gets frustrated. He's like, I don't know what to do. Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus takes his sweet time. And the disciples are like, let's go, Jesus. Someone, you know, everyone is touching. He's like, no, no, no. Let's take a minute here. Someone touched me because power went out from me. Now let me tell you what it says in the book of Leviticus. I'm not going to read it, but the book of Leviticus chapter 15. Whoever touches 
an unclean woman, which is a woman who has an issue of blood, is, is unclean until evening. They have to go and wash their clothes and wash themselves and wait until the next day before they do anything because they're considered unclean. Now remember, the Old Testament and its laws were still the covenant that they were under. Jesus' birth didn't stop the Old Covenant. It changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, not at His birth, but at His death. That was when the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Covenant was poured out on us. And so at this point, He is publicly saying, who touched me? And an unclean woman says, I'm unclean, I'm the one. And He says, go, daughter. That's the only time in the Gospel that Jesus calls a woman daughter. When someone's daughter is at the point of death. Jairus is there like, are you kidding me? I know she's, she's someone's daughter, but my daughter. What about my daughter? And so this woman receives her healing. And I think it's really, really important. The public declaration that Jesus did. Because what he stated by having an unclean person be healed by touching him. Is that your uncleanness does not make me unclean. Anything that touches me that is unclean, I will make you clean. Your uncleanness does not affect me. My cleanness affects you. Some of us come to Jesus and we think we're too dirty. We have to first do, I have to first be clean for a week. Then I'll come to Jesus. Jesus said, that does not offend me, nor does it intimidate me. Come as you are, because there's nothing you've done that will make me unclean. There's no sin that will make me uncomfortable. You are why I came. That's the statement Jesus did. And so as he finishes that, everyone is like, yeah, look at that. He is the law. Because he's, he's not going to go and get himself clean because he is the law. At that moment, he declared, I am the law. And I said, what I declare clean, it is clean. And so then the servants of Jairus comes up and like, sorry to say, but you can stop disturbing Jesus now. Your daughter is already dead. Imagine that for a moment. This is, I want, I want, I'm going to... I want to give an encouragement to those of us who are here today. You're watching online or in the second sanctuary. And you feel like maybe there is that one area that is not worth disturbing Jesus about any longer. Maybe you feel like your marriage is dead. Maybe you feel like your intimacy with Jesus is dead. That fight against addiction, that fight against those struggles, it's dead. I've tried so many times, there's no point in disturbing Jesus anymore. How can Jesus possibly change this? It's dead already. And so that was the moment where Jesus said, Do not doubt, only believe. Right? No, he didn't. He said, Do not fear, only believe. I believe that there's a very important spiritual truth right there. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Fear is. Fear is the opposite of faith. In fact, I believe that faith and doubt can coexist. Because many of us, we have faith. But we're like in this one area. I, 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 I don't know if God can do it for me. I've seen miracles happening. I've seen plenty of women with the issue of blood being healed in the crowd around me. But my situation, I don't know. Why I think that faith and doubt can coexist is because there was a man that came to Jesus and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When he was praying over his son. Meaning your doubt does not intimidate Jesus. Your doubt doesn't stop Jesus from working. I believe that faith is like a heavenly currency. 
It's what you use to cash in miracles. Faith is like a currency of heaven. And as faith is like a heavenly currency, I believe that fear is the currency of demons, is the currency of sickness, is the currency of health. Because fear brings more of whatever you have. Faith brings more of the Holy Spirit. Your, your, your faith is, is getting activated. You, you, your, you get more miracles, more things happening in your life. While fear, on the other hand, will bring more. That's why someone said that the fear of Goliath is more dangerous than Goliath himself. The fear of Goliath held a nation crippled. Goliath himself was defeated by one man. It was supernatural, but it was one man. The fear of Goliath crippled them all. So I want to encourage you to don't worry about, oh, well, I'm doubting. I don't know, is this miracle going to happen for me? It, that's going to get solved. By the time you receive your miracle, that's going to be diffuse. Your doubt will go away. But fear, don't let fear of sickness, fear of death, fear of demons, fear of whatever it might be. Don't let fear grow roots in your heart. Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. Meaning faith pushes fear out. Fear pushes fear out. And then he comes, he follows him. And you know what happens after that. He, Jesus comes to the house. By the way, did you know that the words do not fear? They are in the Bible 365 times. Do not fear, do not be afraid. That means if you're struggling with that, you can start a daily one year devotional to combat fear in your life. You know the word of God is like a sword or something. It kind of defeats those things. You know that, right? It's almost as if it's a weapon that we can use against fearful thoughts. It's almost like it's a weapon that we can use against those things that we're battling with our life. That hopelessness. Oh no, someone told me I shouldn't disturb anymore. My own mind telling me I shouldn't disturb Jesus about that situation anymore. There's 365 verses, one for every day, telling you do not fear. I wonder if I could get the worship team to come up here for a minute. I'm going to start to land here. Um, when Jesus came into Jairus' house, he only brought three disciples. And he came into the house and they were all mourning and wailing and crying and crying out and screaming and one thing after another. And, and then Jesus said the famous words. She's not dead. She's only asleep. What you call dead, I call asleep. Why? Because I can fix this. I can work with this. I can work with this situation. And you think it's gone. You think the life has left. That there is no hope. I'm here to tell you, I am the hope. I can fix this. And so he says... She's not dead. She's only asleep. And you, you see what they do after that. You know, you know this story. They start laughing at Jesus. Imagine that your daughter has died. Maybe it's the wife of Jairus or the people in the household. And he says, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And they literally make fun of him. I think it was a coping mechanism. I think they didn't know how to react to those words. And that's us sometimes. Sometimes we're in situations. It feels like there's no hope. It feels like it's dead. It's gone. Jesus comes in and says, I can actually fix this. You thought that you had passed the line of no return. I've got you. The line of no return, you haven't passed it yet. She's only asleep. And so I want to encourage you here today. And we're going to open up here in a minute for those who maybe they feel like there is something in your life that you feel like that child is dead already. Maybe it's your health. Man, 
I've gone forward for prayer so many times. I've tried, I've prayed, fasted. That sickness just won't give up. Maybe this is my thorn. You know who thinks that way? Someone who thinks that the child is dead. That's my thorn. I just got to live with it for the rest of my life. Those nightmares, I'm just going to live with it for the rest of my life. Whatever it is that I'm facing, that marital issue, we'll never really understand each other. That's just, that's just our portion. That's how you think when you believe the child is dead. My purity, I just can't. I just, can't. I, I, I'm clean for a month. I can resist those things for a month, but then I just fall back again. I try so hard, but, you know, I'm resuscitating the child. That purity in my life, uh, it's in the ER. And I'm like, let's do a seven-day prayer and fasting. My purity is back alive again. You know, that's how many people fast. I used it to fast that way. Oh, I, I fell into sin again. Let me fast to resusc resuscitate that child I call purity. Let me resuscitate that child I call intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Let me resuscitate that child I call my holiness and my relationship with Jesus by fasting and prayer. And you resuscitate it and it goes good. <sighs> and it dies again. One week and one week out. One week in, one week out. Or maybe something else. Maybe you're struggling with whatever it is. The, th the main thing that I'm trying to say here is just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we don't have issues in our life that feel hopeless. I was in a situation just recently, a few years ago. I thought that my marriage would never be restored. I was in Sweden. My wife was here in America. COVID hit. I couldn't come and see her because of immigration issues. I was searching online for hope, like immigration stories. And then I read stories. It took us 25 years. I'm like, 25 years? I'm 32. I'm going to be close to, I'm going to be over 50 years? No, this, this is not normal. And I was, I'm going to be honest, I gave up. There were days and I was like, this child is dead. This child is dead. And then Pastor Vlad and others would call and I'm like, hey, how are you doing up out there? Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm doing, that's, that's for sure. You know, but I felt like there was no hope. And so we face situations in our life. We feel like that child is dead. But Jesus, he doesn't see that as dead. Whatever that thing is in your life, it's not dead. It's just asleep. And Jesus tells everyone, get out of here. You're going to mock me? Let me pray for her. And he prays for her and says, little girl, I say to you right now, rise up. And in that moment, that child was awoken again. And she was alive. And Jesus, immediately the next thing he tells her, take note. Take note. He tells them, feed her. She's alive now. Feed her. Give her food so she can gain strength. 